Hey, Michaela. Yes. Talking houses today. Yep. What's your favourite room in the house and why? My bedroom. <laughs> Do I need to ask why? Actually, should we talk about this off air before you... <laughs> no, no. My husband and I have separate bedrooms, which everyone thinks is weird, but uh-huh. I think it saved our marriage. <laughs> And nice. uh, yeah, so he has his room, which mm-hmm. is his room. So I have mine with all my pretty things and my florally bedspread and my candles, and my yeah. books, and so it's my happy place. Yeah, right. Yeah, so okay. it's got a lock on the door now, so I can keep all the boys out. And <laughs> him, it's like so. the little uh, the little safe cell in the house of it boys. Is. Yeah, and so I can go in there. It's as chic as I can make it. Um, hoping uh, the husband will paint it purple, but I'm still <laughs> waiting for that. But it's my little sanctuary. Nice. And I'm just constantly yelling, boys, get out. Get out of my room. <laughs> Welcome to the Tradies Business Show, helping you get off the tools and into true business ownership so you can spend more time doing the things that matter most. Now, here are your hosts, Warwick Bidwell and Michaela Clark. So welcome to the Tradies Business Show, listeners. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, uh, I don't have a lock on any of the doors in my house. Although, I do get, you know, when you have kids, it's kind of pointless because they just come and. I know my daughter just comes and bangs on the door when I'm in the loo and I have her, and I kind of have to strategically time some of my visits, <laughs> <laughs> my loo breaks. But uh, yeah, it can be hard to get your own space uh, when you've got a big family. Yeah, it was a big thing for us. Like we've, uh, we've always done it. Um, most of the time, um, but uh, especially uh, since we've been in this house eight years, um, yeah, about five years ago we did it, and mm. I just people think we're weird. We get a lot of weird reactions. I just think I don't. I could never. We're at the point now where we could never sleep in the same room as each other, mm. or even be because one wants a TV on when the other doesn't. Everything he like. Look, I'll give you an example. <laughs> He's made a box and painted it like an army box, and that's his box at the foot of the bed right you know so there's a boy's room and the girl's room yes and it couldn't be any more different i've got fairy lights and lovely music and he's just got his he's this blokey and yours is not flannelette shirts hanging up on each got a hook like a nail in the wall and that's where he hangs them and (laughs) so uh well it solves the whole uh doona struggle too you know the eternal battle between the chicks that want three three blankets and the guys who just want the sheet Yep. Uh, so you solved that problem too. And the funny thing is his room is always cleaner and his bed's better made. Yeah, well, you've talked about how Dunk's a bit of a cleaner. He's, he's a bit of a clean freak, so mine's never made. <laughs> <laughs> his is always made. But look, you know, if you're having troubles in your marriage, I don't know, just yeah, think about it. Just don't, move, don't go to a counsellor. Just move into the spare room. Just get your own space. Or you could actually get today's guest to renovate your house for you <laughs> <laughs> and add an extra room or something. That's right. But uh, yeah, we've we've been following today's guest for a while. I know I know you have with a lot of interest, Michaela. Um, uh, so today we're talking to Nicole, the builder's wife. Um, so Nicole and Adam from Fernbrook Homes, and uh, Nicole has her own blog called The Builder's Wife. Um, and it's an interesting journey these guys have been on. I mean, she she gave us an account of her story in uh, the opening of the interview, and she compressed it quite a bit. But uh, they've been through a lot this couple. Yeah, and what I love about this is the way she's using content, which we all know is my passion, to build her business. Um, she has this amazing blog, which is, she says, you know, they publish five to six times a week. However, you know, most of our readers wouldn't need to do anywhere near that, but at least showing how you can use content to promote your business. And it really has blown up for her. Like, you know, she said she got a whole full page in the Courier Mail. Like, mm. that's publicity that you can't buy for her business, talking about her Renault and, and everything. And I, I, I'm convinced this can happen for any type of business if done, you know, the right way. So Absolutely. So, um, yeah, great interview with Nicole. Don't forget to head to tradiesbusinessshow.com. And uh, if you haven't already got your copy, uh, get our our guide, our nine steps to getting off the tools in your tradie business. Uh, you can download that for free and um, it does talk about marketing and content marketing in there and gives you some some tips on how to implement that in your tradie business. So go to tradiesbusinessshow.com and grab that and uh, strap yourself in as we talk to Nicole, the builder's wife. And thanks for joining us, Nicole, today. And I've got to say, I have the biggest library envy Ever of your new library. 
My library is my dream come true. I love it to bits. Oh, it's you know, it's one of those photos that you see on Pinterest and think no one actually owns something like that. That's her beautiful library. So yeah, it it does exist. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it really does exist, but it doesn't always look that good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us a little bit um, about your backstory, Nicole, and how you came to be part of um, the building industry and this wonderful blog, The Builder's Wife. Okay, well, I grew up a tradies' daughter. Dad's a plasterer. My brother's now a plasterer, so I've always been around trades, but I never thought for a minute it'd be something I could make a career out of. Um, I started my career in pharmacy and went on to pharmacy management by the time I finished up there. I was managing 13 pharmacies, so very different to what I do now, but very similar in a lot of ways as well. Um, with my marriage breakdown, uh, we it was really hard to do that and look after the two kids on my own. So I had taken a step back and was just doing a different style of management of pharmacy, but the same sort of thing. So I was managing buying uh, within pharmacy. Um, from there, I went on and met my new husband and he was a builder. We worked together a little bit on his business. He initially was working with his parents in their family business and it just wasn't going in the direction that we probably wanted what we were doing to go in. So we decided to branch out on our own five years ago and we haven't looked back. Awesome. Um, yeah. So that was that was a very succinct version, Nicole. <laughs> uh, how many years did that little uh, story span? Uh, so I was in pharmacy for about 13 years. Yeah, right. And then I had a couple of years where I didn't do a huge amount. I was working just sort of part-time. And then we went into uh, – so we probably worked with the builder's parents for about two years before we then branched out on our own. Yeah, okay. And what were some of the initial, I guess, fears that you had around going out on your own and starting up? And I guess tell us a little bit more about where the company is now. Cash flow. It's always cash flow. That's always been my biggest fear. How do we get enough money to pay the bills? Um, are we going to pay them on time? Can we do it all on our own? It was a pretty big, scary adventure in the beginning. Uh, and it started, we had a really tough first three years and it's only been in the last two years that we've really started to move forward and not really be chasing our tail all the time. Now we're just chasing our tail trying to find people to help us get through all the work. <laughs> so it's been quite an adventure um, and probably harder than I thought it was going to be in the beginning, but it was just about that determination to get through each day. And so what were some of the challenges you faced in that first three years? You said that was a, a bit tough. Finding work. It was really hard. So we had plenty of we call the work now rats and mice, so it's the smaller kind of work and Adam would be on the tools and we just weren't making any money. It was really hard to generate enough work to keep him busy enough to make money. That was really, really hard. But now that we changed our focus, we changed the way we market ourselves, we've changed, we added in the blog. Um, once we sort of looked at the, I guess what we were showing people that we wanted to do and we changed the way we explained what we wanted to do. Everything else followed. And so talk a little bit more about those, those, that tipping point and those changes in the marketing that you did. Um, and, and then we can touch on the blog in a minute as well. We had a conversation one day about what other people would see if they looked at us and our business model and what we were doing. And it was exactly what we were getting. Everything that we were projecting to people was exactly what we were getting. It was small work. It was a husband and wife team that was just doing all the work themselves and it really wasn't what we wanted to do. We wanted to grow our business so it was bigger. We wanted Adam to come off the tools and work in the office with me um, so that we could be working on our business, not in our business. And it was that conversation that really made us step back and think, okay, well, let's change the way we're projecting ourselves to our clients and our friends and our family even. And that was the, the total tipping point. Once that changed, everything changed. Yeah, and so was that more about being uh, seen to be more of a, a building company and, and a bigger company than just sort of the ha husband and wife team? Absolutely. Yeah. I think initially we were sort of showing ourselves as handymen or that person you could call when you're in a spot of bother and he'd come and fix it. So then it went on to – we were given a really great opportunity. We got to build a bigger house, so it was a great display, but it was the perfect time also to change the way – we even thought about ourselves. So we went from thinking of ourselves as 
those people that can help with anything to being builders of custom homes and renovators of Queenslanders. So it was really refining exactly what we wanted to do. So in all our conversations then and every time we spoke and all our marketing and everything we did was all based around those points. And so tell us a little bit more about the blog because this is what I, I really get excited for in our industry. That you've taken um, something that we talk about all the time around content and really made, um, you know, it's got its own personality now and I'm sure that it has helped build the business as well. So what was the theory behind The Builder's Wife? There was two. In the beginning, it was a way to show our clients who we were. So it was, I guess, a soft way to advertise who Adam and Nicole were, the people behind Fernbrook Homes. But it was also then about we had a renovation here in our own Queenslander and we wanted to show people what you can do, what's possible, what we do, how we can do it. And I guess it was just a really soft way of saying, hi, we're here, this is who we are, this is what you can do too. But it grew from there exponentially. Um, and now it's a real opportunity to explain to people and have a dialogue and have that content about different processes and procedures within building or renovating a home. So I, it gives me a great opportunity to show clients little things like why my builder isn't on site every day or big things like what these items are in your contract that you've never heard of before. It's a great opportunity to give our clients a chance to be educated before they take that next step. And so have you seen a direct impact um, from having that blog through to, you know, getting higher uh, conversions or bigger paying jobs? Because I know, like, you know, the story of the Queenslander, I mean, you're doing what you're, you're selling as well. So, you know, have you got business through that blog, essentially? Yes, we have. Yeah. We've had a great deal of interest. In fact, surprisingly, a lot of interest has come from out of state. So we've had quite a few investors get in contact with us because they've purchased Queenslanders in and around Brisbane and they need our help to renovate those Queenslanders and they can trust or they feel they can trust us because they know who we are through the blog. It's just so interesting that you're, you know, you're being specialists in a niche and doing that through content and that's what I think so many people in this industry don't take advantage of and that they, they're not targeting themselves like you got refocused but yeah. also how you're projecting that out to the market. Honestly, I don't know that it was as a thought out a process as it sounds like now. I think <laughs> just in the it beginning is. it really just, just, just go happen. with it. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I'll take that. And so I know like writing this kind of content and it is a wonderful blog at thebuilders.com. Is it builderswife.com? Builderswife.com. Um so how, how many hours a week would you spend on that, would you say? Like, I'm sure you're investing a lot of time into it. There is quite a bit of time because it's not just the blog, then it's all the social media channels. It's um, converting that to actually talking to people about it. So there's public speaking, there's meeting with our readers. So it's nearly a full-time job in itself, but it can be done as simply as writing a blog post. So we write uh, five to six days a week. And those can be done anywhere from half an hour to two hours, depending on the content and what we're writing about. Um, and then the rest of it is something that I'm just very passionate about. So I'm passionate about re meeting our readers and understanding what it is that they would like to understand. I'm passionate about the social media. So we've got a bigger outreach to clients and they can find us on any different level that they're looking. Um, so it can be really quick and easy or it can be as involved as you like. So, Nicole, you talk about we when you talk about writing these blog posts. I'm guessing that you're referring to Adam? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of our listeners are in husband and wife teams or, you know, like partnerships in business uh, where their life partner is, is working with them in some capacity. Yeah. How, how do you guys uh, make that work and, you know, what sort of, I guess, challenges have you faced along the way in terms of working together in all areas of the business by the sounds of it? We do. We work together in everything. And, well, it's not real good when you're having a fight. <laughs> you can't get away from one another. <laughs> Sometimes it can be really hard to put aside personal and business, but the truth is it's all one and the same anyway for us. When you're working together, it is a 24-7 kind of environment. Um, challenges, I guess, defining roles. Uh, for a long time, Adam would introduce me as his wife and not his business partner, and I really, really hated that. I felt... It defined who I was in the business. I was just the wife and it's just not true. I'm his partner. Mm. Um, so that was a real challenge 
to define our roles for each other and where we fit and how we work together. That was a really big challenge. Other than that, we're lucky we really like one another, so it makes it easy to <laughs> that work helps. together. That helps. <laughs> it does. So how did you um, go, sorry, Nicole, how did you go about defining those roles? I mean, did you do that formally or was it something that just sort of worked itself out? What was your approach to that? We did try it, just letting it run its course and work itself out, but that really didn't work. It really took a conversation. It took a bit of research about understanding where each of us were at. So we both read a lot about what we do. We're quite involved within the industry so that we could learn and understand, um, give ourselves job titles and just have a great understanding of where we're both placed. It also took a bit of time to sit down and write some lists about who's good at what and what we're not good at and being honest with one another about what we can and can't do. So that was really, that was probably harder for Adam than it was for myself because he'd been doing it for 20 odd years before I came along. Mm. Yeah, it was it, a real change in thought pattern for him. It really is so important to formalise that process and it's great yeah, to it is. you guys have, have literally done what I guess uh, Michaela and I preach to tradies all the time is sit down and actually write down who's going to do what so you've got those expectations clear. Yeah, it can be a really big process, even though it's quite a simple one, but it's a big process to change the way you think about it all. Because I think certainly for us in the beginning, we were quite casual about starting this husband and wife business, but it was realizing that the casual nature in which we were doing it wasn't working. We had to formalize it. We needed to be professional because that's what we are. So it was um, making changes like we have a meeting every week. Actually, we have two meetings each week. Uh, we have definite hours that we work. Obviously, those infringe into personal time on some days when there's too much to do, but mm. there's certainly hours in which we're both at work doing what we do. Um, so it was about making it, yeah, as you say, more formal, and there are processes involved rather than just sort of having casual conversations here and there. And what's been the flow through to dealing with clients? I mean, I can, I can make some assumptions there, but... Uh, Talk to me about how you and Adam work together with clients as well. Right from the very beginning now. For a long time, um, Adam would do the whole quoting process and be involved from the beginning and I'd come in once the contract was signed. But we found that uh, our clientele has changed. I think the blog might have a bit to do with this. And a lot of our clientele now are still couples, but we're dealing with the wife or the female in the partnership, or we're dealing with, we have lots of clients that are single women as well. So I've come on board right from the very first meeting. In fact, we've even changed on the website. So the all the contact details are mine. When you ring through, you ring through to me. So from the very beginning, you're speaking with myself. We work together. We go to the quote. Adam does the formal side of the quote, but then we go together and present the quote. And I'm on site twice a week, checking up with the boys, making sure that it's all running to plan, meeting with the clients, making sure that they can communicate what it is that they're not happy with or what they're expecting. And then we also work together so that we're emailing out client schedules each week. So right from the very beginning to the very end, I'm involved. And then we touch base afterwards as well. How do the, where there's husbands involved, how do they respond to that? Really well. Uh, in the When I very first started in the industry, so back when, we were working with Adam's parents, we found that the males were less likely to want to have anything to do with me if anything came from me at all. But we ch had a big change in focus in our own business when we started our own business and we weeded out all those, I call them old-fashioned trades people that weren't interested in dealing with a woman. Uh -huh. And we found that that's had a real flow on now to the business. So all our clients are very much on board with, I can't recall a time I've ever had a client that wasn't happy to deal with me the same way they deal with Adam. Mm. Another big um, win you had last year was the HIA Queensland Business Partner of the Year Award. Yeah. Uh, congratulations Thank on you. that. That must have been uh, quite a, a great feeling to win that. It was a massive surprise. I had no idea that I was nominated. That was Adam being sneaky. Uh -huh. oh, a huge nice? surprise. Brownie <laughs> points yeah, galore. <laughs> he sure did. <laughs> so something we do talk about is um, – entering business awards to help you get your business out there and some brand awareness. How yes. have you found actually, well, maybe we should ask Adam the actual process of doing the award submission, but what it's led to um, afterwards? 
Adam tells me, so we did go back through after I had won the award and he showed me what he'd done. It was actually quite easy, um, but something he did put a lot of time into to make sure that it was presented exactly the way he wanted to present it. Um, so the process of, of writing the submission for this particular award was not too hard at all. The follow through, the flow on from winning the award, the award has been amazing. It gives instant credibility. Um, just having that badge on the website, having the badge on the blog and on our email signatures, instant credibility, but it's been so much bigger than that. There's been, um, it's flown on then to an article by the Courier, or that was the Sunday Mail actually, so they could learn more about what we're doing. Um, it's, it just, it gives, I find that the clients have more peace of mind and because they have that bit of credibility that wasn't there before. Not to say that we weren't the same people before we won the award, but they didn't know that we potentially could. Yeah, because I know a lot of our, our listeners often say, oh, they take so much time and effort, but really, you know, even just being part of it and, and then to win really does have that payoff effect, doesn't it? Like you said, it's, you know, that credibility factor is just sort of built in before you even have a conversation. It's enormous and the opportunities that have opened to us since the award, there was actually two awards last year. So there was another one called um, Recognising Women in the Construction Industry. So that opened a whole bunch of other doors and I have now have contacts that we didn't have 12 months ago and I was only a finalist in that one. Um, certainly winning had more benefits but being a finalist had great benefits as well, lots of opportunities that we didn't have. And it it's, uh, provides networking opportunities too. With, Absolutely. Yeah, other great businesses that it's not just about winning the award and getting the badge to stick on your website, but it's, That's it's the right. people you're connecting with, isn't it? Yeah, we've had some, just the contacts we've come away with have been amazing and opportunities left, right and centre. It's really made a big difference. So what's the, what's the vision for the business? I mean, it sounds like you're pretty big thinkers. I mean, where are you guys headed with all of this? So we've gone from, initially when we started the business, our focus was new homes, but we found that we just couldn't compete. We weren't big enough to be able to compete. So now our focus is quite simply to renovate Queenslanders. We've recently refined where we're looking to do that. So it's just in and around Brisbane and Ipswich um, and their surrounding suburbs. And we have gone from, so maybe two years ago, we were looking at doing maybe six jobs a year. Now we've pushed forward and we've equipped ourselves and we're ready to go for 12 to 14 jobs a year. And we include in that a couple of custom homes each year as well because we really enjoy those challenging jobs. Everyone's going to roll their eyes at me now. <laughs> really, you know, those jobs on the difficult sites or the clients that are after something really different in particular, we really enjoy that challenge. So that's where our focus is for the next 12, 18 months. And from there, we'll see where we go. It sounds like every renovation. Yeah. More challenging. <laughs> as soon as you start pulling Renault sheets off the up. walls, it's like, whoa, we didn't know that was in there. There's always a surprise. Well, I've got a, a, I have a Queenslander. It's 87 years old. So we're planning for its 100th year. It's going to get a makeover. So, yeah. yes, hopefully you're, you're working a little <laughs> bit north by then. But I've already got you in mind. Thank you. I'd love to help you out. <laughs> So I just had a question, Nicole. You know, yep. you talk about those challenging jobs, and certainly with renovating older homes, uh, I know you can uncover some surprises. Mm. Uh, how do you guys go about dealing with? I mean, specifically that, but just for our listeners' sake as well. I mean, they would have the same sort of issues, whether they're motor mechanics or plumbers or whatever. Is you uncover Absolutely. things that you couldn't foresee? Yeah. How on earth do you deal with that with your clients? So we have those conversations before we even sign a contract. Um, our clients are made really aware that we suggest they always have a contingency budget because you don't know what you're going to uncover. But we also just have a conversation. So for us and where we find the greatest success in our business is all based around communication. So if we're communicating with our clients right from the very beginning that we don't anticipate any issues but occasionally this can happen or we've had this happen, they're aware that it's not such a great surprise if something does go wrong or if we find something that we need to fix. So really for us, it's always just been about having open and clear communication right from the very beginning. So one thing with those plans, uh, sort of 
doubling the amount of work that you do in a year. A, a key part of that is mm-hmm. your subcontractors and your relationship with other trades. And I know we yeah. hear a lot of our, at least it's so hard to get help and, and I know you mentioned it's a current challenge now. So what are the, yeah. some of the tips that you have for our listeners in, firstly, I guess, engaging in with builders and the other thing is, you know, people looking for other subcontractors is the best way to go about uh, getting and securing them. Um, it, that is probably the million-dollar question. It really is the hardest part that we have found in recent times with expanding. We've um, There's been several avenues we've taken. The most successful has actually been advertising on Facebook, believe it or not. We've had we've found some of our best tradies via Facebook. Uh, their wives or their partners have tagged them or their friends tagged them. That's been – still blows my mind that that's how they've come to us. Other than that, it's about those um, networking opportunities that we spoke about earlier and having keeping a broad range of contacts that you can tap into when you find a need – for a particular person or trade or subcontractor, um, that's been really helpful as well. And again, it's been about communication. So I will talk to them in the beginning as well. For us, it's really important that they're prepared to deal with myself. If they're happy to deal with me, take instruction and direction from me, then we're quite comfortable for them to go and deal with a client. Um, so yeah, I guess that's been our process from the, the get go, but it is quite, they're rare as hen's teeth. It's not the easiest thing in the world to find. One other thing that I know that uh, you've been doing is you've got a private Facebook group or, or yes, public Facebook do. group called yeah. Ask the Builder, which I think is a great avenue for um, a lot of people in our industry to, to offer value and provide helpful information and, and give back a little bit, but as well as, you know, get their name out there. So how have you found having that group? It's been great. Again, it builds credibility just by being prepared to give some information. You know, when you're asking a builder something, they can answer so many questions that others can't. It's a quick and easy thing for Adam to sit down and write a response to a question, but it makes such a big difference to the person who doesn't have that answer in the first place. It can really narrow down that time that they're looking for an answer. So it's really built credibility. But again, it also increases our profile. People that didn't know about us before now know who we are. Um, It's a great tool. Awesome. So you've covered uh, so much ground there, Nicole. I'm sure there's uh, there's a million things we could sort of pull out of your business journey or yours and Adam's anyway. Um, but one thing or one question we like to ask all of our guests, and this will be interesting coming from you, is <laughs> if you had a thousand tradies in a room, what's one piece of advice you would love to, to give them? Communicate. Communicate, communicate, be open with your communication. With communication, any problem can be solved. There is no issue too large. It's, everything boils down to communication. And so I'm going to dig a little deeper into your response, and it's a great, it's a great answer. Uh, can you give some specifics on how our listeners might shift their communication? Like if they're sitting there going, yeah, well, that, that sounds great, but how the bloody hell do I do that? Um, I think it's really important to have a dialogue with your clients, your subcontractors, with each other. It doesn't matter how you do it, but you also then need to put it in written format so that everybody's got a clear account of what happened. Um, it can't, it's not always easy to communicate. We certainly have had tradespeople, clients at certain times that are a bit harder to communicate with than others. But if you're having that open dialogue and then you follow it up with the written format, there's always that piece of the puzzle that's right there in front of everybody. And because communication, we all hear what we want to hear or we all take out of it what we need to take out of it. But if it's written in black and white, it's very plain to see what at least I said or heard and then the other person can respond. Awesome. Thanks, Nicole. That's okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. So, if thanks our for listeners, me. yes. So, if our listeners want to find out more about uh, yourself and the business, where would they go? They can come visit us at thebuilderswife.com.au or pop over to fernbrookhomes.com.au. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Nicole. Uh, I want to go and buy myself a Queenslander now, so you guys can renovate <laughs> it for me because I've seen the photos. I follow you on Instagram. And the photos of your Queensland are just, they make me cry because uh, it's just such a beautiful home. And, uh, it certainly is all my dreams come true. It's a credit to both of you. So uh, Thank thanks you. again for your time, mate. Thanks. Thank you. You've been listening to The Tradies Business Show with Warwick Bidwell and Michaela Clark. Want to get off the tools into true business ownership? Find out how at tradiesbusinessshow.com.